Each year, we stage the seminal battle of our generation between the alphas who touch grass and the spreadsheet socialists who write code. Oh, I'm feeling great. This is one of my favorite shows to do every year. But today, we're going to make some changes, not just in the world, but in the fantasy football community <laughs> at large, because we're going to take back fantasy oh football goodness. today. <laughs> no, we could be a little bit normal, but the, we are taking tissue, it back today. The tissue is there for... Uh... Evan's inability to listen to reason. <laughs> Here's how things are going to work on today's show. We have identified 14 of the biggest discrepancies between our ETR top 300 half PPR rankings and Silva's top 150. I will allow these two to civilly debate their positions on each, and then I'll make a ruling on who won. We're going to start with a bit of a weird one. Devon Achan, we are higher on than market in the top 300 rankings. ETR rankings are at 17 overall and RB7, which I thought was high, but I felt good about. Silva comes in even hotter on Devon Achan. 11 overall and the RB5. I'll let Evan go first here, Evan. We thought we were high on Devon Achan. Evan comes in rip-roaring hot. Go ahead on the Achan rank here, Evan. Yeah, I don't want to be late to this dance. I think that he has a legendary season in his range of potential outcomes. I don't even think I'm that aggressive on it. I, I know that I am compared to Margit, compared to your, your uh, you guys uh, in, in the uh, the data staff. But I, so I have a, a, a tier one of Christian McCaffrey, B. John Robinson, Brees Hall. These are all like top five picks. Um, and then I have in my second tier, Jameer Gibbs and Devin Achan, just a two-man two second tier. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that Jameer Gibbs and... Devin A. Chan can both like both have that. They, they don't have it as high of a floor as the guys in the top tier, but they have the upside to leap into that tier. Raheem Mostert is what, 32, 33 years old. Jalen Wright in the same backfield is, you know, a, a, an intriguing yet, you know, a lot, lot of like developmental stuff going on with him. He wasn't a pass protector. He, he, he fumbled in college. Uh, but very, very talented. But I don't know that he's going to have any kind of a role early in the season. Devin A. Chan, you know, he fits the Mike McDaniel offense to a T. And Mike McDaniel is so good at funneling the balls, fun funneling the football to his top playmakers. And A. Chan qualifies. This offense is super, super explosive. And A. Chan is an, an extraordinary fit. I think that he has the potential to be like, a you know, a, a Chris Johnson type of player. And I don't want to be late to that dance. And I and I like him better than that cluster of receivers that that I have ranked after him, uh, like Chris Olave, Nico Collins. I would rather go with Devin H. Chan, especially in home leagues. Okay. Cut his mic. Leone, your retort. Yeah. I mean, this is a tough one because I mostly agree with Evan. Like, A. Chan is someone, as Evan said, you don't want to be late to the party. Like, the ceiling here is absolutely incredible. The way they had worked him into the passing game a little bit too, I think gives him like a slightly better floor than a lot of the market indicates. Um, he's so efficient that even if he splits time with Mostert for the whole season, I think like at worst, it's a small loss. And at best, you have a really big hit. So we're both ahead of market on A-Chan. Uh, and he's one of those backs too that's rare. And home leagues, a lot of the backs get pushed up and they go early. A-Chan's sort of the exception where he stays where he is if you compare him to like best ball league. So there's really good opportunity there. Uh, the reason we're lower is just, I think that the overall workloads for Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley, two other players that are really talented, elite prospects. We just have those guys higher and better picks. Now, relative to cost, A-Chan is a better pick, but if you're giving it to me straight up, I still have to lean the workload edge that JT and Saquon are going to get in offenses, I think are going to be good. Like Philly should be really high scoring. Um, Indy showed a lot of upside with Anthony Richardson prior to his injury last year. I think that, you know, playing with a mobile quarterback should open up some running efficiency. Our data team looked at this and there's only a slight edge there, but it's still something that you have to consider for a back like JT that has an ability to break off these really long runs. Okay, let me ask a follow-up, Evan. If How many touches per game do you think Devon Achan will get in this backfield? Because to me, that's the big question. If he only gets 12 per game or 13 per game, that's probably not going to be enough to pay it off 
at 11 overall, in my opinion. So how would you re- respond to that, Evan? I think he can get to 15 to 17 per game. I mean, he's not that small of a guy. Um, and again, Mike McDaniel is hell bent on feeding his best players. I mean, I think that we, we've kind of determined over the, you know, doing this for what, 15, 20 years, that the best coaches, what, what defines a, a, an excellent offensive coach is his ability to get the ball to his best players. And that's what Mike McDaniel will do. Um, I think that in his second year, why isn't there significant room for growth uh, for A-Chan? Um, I, I, he's going to be trusted more. Again, Mostert a, a year, uh, is a year older. Um, so I, 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 think that, I think that he can get to, to 17, 18 touches, even in a best-case scenario. Yeah, I mean, if you told me he was going to get to 17 or 18 touches, I, I would for sure take him, uh, Devon A-Chan, in round one. I am going to give this here round one to Evan because I think in home leagues, leaning running back early is something that I've talked about a bunch. I talked about in my 2024 strategy article, which you can find on the site. And so I'm worried that a chance workload is not going to be what everybody wants or thinks it should be, but leaning into ceiling outcomes where HN does get to that 17 or 18 touches per game, he'll be a good back end round one pick. Let's go to the second debate of the day. And it is, Drake London. This is a spot where ETR ranks are higher than Silva. Drake London ETR is at 11 overall, the wide receiver 8. Silva is at 19 overall, the wide receiver 13. Leone, go ahead on the Drake London 11 overall position. Yeah, I honestly think our base projection for Drake London, which is about a 22% target share, is conservative. And we still have him ranked this high because I don't think people are totally understanding just how dramatic the change in Atlanta is going to be. We have them attempting five more passes per game. Uh, That's like two full games of pass attempts over the course of the season, more than they had last year. And additionally, those attempts are going to be coming from a much more efficient, better quarterback in Kirk Cousins or even Michael Penix if he ends up having to play than what we saw with Desmond Ritter, Taylor Heineke, Marcus Mariota the year prior. And Drake London was the top wide receiver in his rookie class. He was right there prospect wise um, in our dynasty rankings after the NFL draft that he got taken after his year one rookie season. The only thing that really kept him behind Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave was the fact that he played for this Atlanta team under Arthur Smith that didn't throw a lot. Now you've got a new coaching staff went over the systemic stuff. And I think it's a combination of volume meeting an elite player entering the prime of his career that's just been hidden because of the structure around him previously. Mm, okay. Evan's a little bit lower here on Drake London. Not only is Evan lower on Drake London uh, just raw, but he also has Drake London behind DJ Moore, Nico Collins, Chris Olave, Marvin Harrison, et cetera. So a little bit lighter here on Drake London. Evan, go ahead with your retort. So you guys have Drake London, a player who has had yardage totals in his first two NFL seasons of 866 and 905 and six career touchdowns entering his third season as your 11th overall player. Is that correct? That is this correct. Is, this is exactly why he's such a bargain because people are going to look at those raw numbers and totally butcher what they mean. I'll say so his this ADP. is like balls to the wall projection. This is just all statistical projection. You think you know better than the two date <laughs> production says? No, and I we think we know better. Actually, it's more what he's actually done on a per route basis right. applied to a completely different. Oh, I think he's good, and that's why I have him as a top twenty overall player. Um, so if you, you just, know, take I, I actually think that I'm being and aggressive. You give him a I think that you're being crazy. <laughs> his quarterback is 36 years old, coming off a torn Achilles. Okay, he again has never topped 900 yards before in the NFL. I think that the you you guys are, you know, and I like the Falcons offense. Again, I have Drake London as a top 20 overall player, even though he's really hasn't been, you know, productive in bulk to this point. What about the possibility that the Falcons are very run heavy again? Um, they have Bijan Robinson. They have Tyler Algier. If you look at the complexion of their offensive line, they have power players on the offensive line. What, what if they're like run heavy again? I mean, that I don't think they're going to be it's Arthur Smith. It's going to be Smith very difficult heavy. for them and to the be And the quarterback play will be better. But I mean, they're, they're, you're, I think that you're 
you're, you're, you're being a slave to the projections here and not account and, and not considering the possibility that it might not go the way that you're projecting it. You're being a slave to raw numbers that mean nothing uh, is the issue. And that's that's why opportunities exist in fantasy football, because so many people need to see it before they play it. And that gives us opportunity. If you ha- wait to see something before you play it. You're always going to get at best small wins. These are opportunities for big wins that yardage total that Silva is talking about. Atlanta had games with 18 pass attempts, 21 pass attempts, 21 pass attempts, 20 pass attempts. Even if Atlanta skews run heavy for a normal offense, it's going to be nowhere near that type of passing volume. And the efficiency of those targets are going to be incredible. And if you look at the people around Drake London, we're being conservative with his target share at 22, 23%. This is a guy that could be a 25, 27% target share player. Well, an important point here, I think, is that both of us are higher than market. Drake London's home league ADP right now is 23 overall. So Evan's still higher than market on Drake London at 19 overall. Obviously, we're way higher. It's just an important note, I think, for using what no matter what rankings you choose to use for your draft, Evans or the ETR top 300s, you have to be aware of where these guys are likely to go. I am going to give the win here to Evan. Yeah. It, this is unbelievable. Yes, sir. Let's just read off last year's stats and, and make just fantasy assume football. those are great again. Again, based on wanting to lean a little bit more running back heavy at the beginning. And I think Evan does make a good point that I hadn't really crossed my mind that this team could be relatively run heavy. I think they'll be balanced, but could be relatively run heavy. I still really, really like Drake London. Like I would have Drake London above DJ Moore easily. Evan has it the other way. I would have Drake London probably ahead of Chris Olave as well. Evan has it uh, the other way. And I would have Drake London probably ahead of a guy that we're going to get a rookie. We're going to get ahead of. Uh, sounds like you're giving next. me the W. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it sounds like no, to me. No, no. You already no. named the winner. I already named the winner. Named the winner, <laughs> named the winner right. and then put him at our positional rank. Let's go to the third debate of the day. It is Malik Neighbors. There's another one similar to HN. I thought we were really high on Malik Neighbors. And there's been a ton of steam lately. If you guys are on Twitter, you see these highlights. You see Ron on going nuts about Malik Neighbors dominating these controlled scrimmages and practices, which is not going to help his ADP. However, we were already mega high on Neighbors all summer. We have him 27 overall, the wide receiver 18. Silva comes in smoking hot, even hotter on Malik Neighbors, 18 overall, the wide receiver 12. So again, this is way above market. 54 overall is Neighbors' current home league ADP. I don't think that's going to stay and stick, but as of now, 54 overall on Neighbors. Evan, I will let you go first here on the rookie for the Giants. I want to get Malik Neighbors on my teams this year. And in the drafts that I've done recently, you're absolutely right. I think it's been a reflection of his rising ADP. Like he's going to, he's going in the, like he's not getting out of the third round. No. Um, I'm doing a draft right now, the apex fantasy league, or, um, and it is uh, it's full PPR. You can start four receivers and he went in the middle of the second round. I thought I could get him. I'm, I'm at, in the back half of the second round. I thought I could get him to be my wide receiver too. He went ahead of me. So I'm a little bit influenced by that, but I also put my money where my mouth is today, and I uh, I, I put a, a, a significant wager on Malik Neighbors to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. That's fourteen to one on DraftKings. I don't know; you should chop around, whatever. But I like that at fourteen to one. Um, Malik Neighbors is going to be the centerpiece of the Giants' offense. We saw what Brian Dayball was able to scheme up with Stephon Diggs in Buffalo early in his Buffalo career, and um, I think Malik Neighbors is like better than Stefan Diggs. I think he's going to be a better NFL player than Stefan Diggs. He can win inside and out. Um, he can win deep and short and intermediate. Um, Daniel Jones is good enough. You know, we don't think that Daniel Jones is necessarily a quality NFL starter or anything like that, but he's good enough to get the ball to Malik neighbors. And um, so is Drew Locke, I think, if, if they decide to pull the cord on Daniel Jones. By the way, Daniel Jones, for wh- whatever it's worth, has been starting to get some positive reviews in training camp, largely because he's getting the ball to Malik Neighbors. This team is not going to have a good defense. They're going to have to compensate for that offensively, and they don't really have any other playmakers. At running back, I mean, they're starting Devin Singletary. 
you know, at, at receiver. They've got a bunch of garbage behind Malik Neighbors. He's he's going to get the ball so much. Jordan Renon recently suggested that he could go for 150 targets. I think that he could go for 160 or 170. All right. Leone, your retort. Yeah, I mean, I'll capitulate here. I really like Malik Neighbors. I'm extremely tilted at the training camp height because I think it's giving people that for bad reasons, didn't have Malik Neighbors high enough an excuse to come up to where we've been from the get-go, from the jump on Malik Neighbors. So it's been really frustrating. So I do think we're probably a little bit light. Part of that was like we were playing into the market and now the market's adjusting. And as Evan said, uh, he's starting to go at the 2-3 turn or even the middle of the second. So I, I, I love Neighbors. He's one of the best wide receiver prospects we had the last handful of years. I think he has a chance to break like the rookie target record he's a great run after the catch guy so i'm really in i mean you can like nitpick the quarterback play like daniel jones is fine but he's clearly like not as good as some of these other quarterbacks i will say i'm not going to go as far as some and like put him like flip him with marvin harrison jr i think that's a little bit of like vividness bias where we're just seeing these training camp highlights from neighbors we're getting excited about him and there's no reason that like he should jump ahead of marvin harrison based on that um unless you know that's just what's your prior to begin with so i could see the hype getting a little out of control but i'd like to come up a little bit closer to where evan is at cool mm. i you know i have thought about moving him ahead of marvin harrison i just um, think the ga game would, environment would you have done that without like like if harrison had crazy training camp hype you wouldn't be doing that i don't think that it's training camp hype necessarily i i think that there were people in the nfl a lot of people in the nfl that actually thought malik neighbors was better than Marvin Harrison. Marvin Harrison was a cleaner prospect. Um, I think that the way that Malik Neighbors wins, he might um, have a higher target ceiling than Marvin Harrison. And also just, I mean, the, the Cardinals have a, a few playmakers. Uh, yeah. You know, besides I, Marvin Harrison, the Giants being don't have a good offense else. isn't a bad thing. You know, right. Like, uh, yeah. To an extent. I think the game, the game environments for the Cardinals to me are going to be yeah. so much better. You get cleaner weather, you get so many more dome games, you get you get just a terrible, terrible Cardinals defense. So yeah, I, it's easily Harrison over Neighbors for me. Evan has them two spots apart right now. Harrison fifteen, Neighbors seventeen. Like I said in the ETR top three hundred, we had Harrison fifteen and Neighbors twenty seven. And I was gonna, I thought that one that argument was close, but Leone just capitulated right out of the gap. So. Three nothing, Evan, out of the gate. My God. Yeah. Well, two of those. I mean, All right. we're just we're, there's going to be an appeal. Fourth player to talk about in this man versus machine debate is DJ Moore. We are far lower than Evan on DJ Moore in the top three hundreds. ETR thirty six overall on DJ Moore, wide receiver twenty two. Silva nineteen overall, wide receiver thirteen on DJ Moore. Leone, I give you the floor first here on Mr. DJM. Yeah, I mean, first off, Evan whooped my butt on this one last year. You know, I took an L um, on this one last year. I think it was a combination of Evan was totally right. And but DJ Moore also sun <laughs> was doing some serious sun running last year and, and some how some of those plays came together. Some of those games came together for him, had some huge, huge outings, had a lot of really floor games, too. But that's that's immaterial this year. It's a totally new offense and setup. You've got a new quarterback with Caleb Williams in Justin Fields out. I think that's a good thing for DJ Moore, even though it worked out for him last year. I think Caleb Williams is a better quarterback, but you've also got way more target competition. Uh, last year, you basically had nothing uh, for DJ Moore. This year, you've got Keenan Allen coming in, known target hog. You've also got Roma Dunze, who was the ninth overall pick in the draft. Some had him like close to that tier of Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors. I know some teams in the NFL did have him ahead of Malik Neighbors. And it's no coincidence that later on Roma Dunze is going to be on here. But like there's a chance he's the best wide receiver on the team from day one. So when you look at the price tags of all these Bears receivers, I just think Moore's, I think Moore's is fine. It's just hard for me to really, I think you're really buying the top if you have him up where Evan is given the overall competition, but he's a really talented player. I think the offense is going to be good. I don't think he's going to be a miss. I just think that it's rich to have him up to wide receiver 13 ahead of guys like Devontae Smith, 
um, you know, Mike Evans, Cooper Cup, Nico Collins. Like that's just such an aggressive ranking versus I, some of these guys. I have Nico Collins yeah. ahead of uh, – DJ Moore, to be clear, the, the the receivers that Evan has DJ Moore ahead of are Drake London, Devonte Adams, Jalen Waddle, Cooper Cup, Devonta Smith, Mike Evans. That's that's who Evan has ahead of DJ Moore. Evan, go ahead with your reply on DJ Moore. I mean, I agree with most of what Leone said. Caleb Williams is a better quarterback than Justin Fields. Um, I don't agree um, that uh, that like Roma Dunze is gonna. Very, I mean, extremely slim chance that he comes in and is the number one receiver right away. I don't even think he's going to get that usage early in the season because I think that he's not going to be involved in three receiver three receiver sets right away. I think it'll be Keenan Allen and DJ Moore out there. DJ Moore is twenty seven years old. Why does DJ Moore like get disrespected? Dude, he's I love DJ Moore. Old. I've been a DJ Moore. Like, he's I, great. I, I, I think you, you've kind of liked DJ Moore over the years more than most. I'm not even necessarily talking about you. I think that he gets some level of disrespect for some reason because he didn't score a lot of touchdowns in Carolina or something. He had 136 targets last year, okay, on a run first team with a worse quarterback and had an incredible season. I mean, I think that the arrow might still be pointing up. He can't get back to 136 targets. They're going to throw the ball more under Shane Waldron um, because they have a better quarterback. Yeah, I mean, he better get 136 targets where you have him ranked. <laughs> I mean, he better. Like, you're, you're in some serious trouble if he doesn't. All right. I am going to give that one to Leone. I think the target competition point, and we're going to get to Roma Dunze here in a bit. I think Evan is underrating a bit the ability of Roma Dunze, Keenan Allen, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift to earn targets at a rate that we just – haven't seen well, well we, we don't have it on here because we're, we're not debating Roma Dunze today but we ha oh 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 he's the last oh guy. we are well we we, sh we could just settle that right now I mean okay let's go to Roma let, I, I'm gonna give that one to Leone that's fine let's go let's go to Roma Dunze now let me just I don't even this. think that we need to include this in the debate because I already capitulated we talked about this in our slack and um you know I came up I'm not as you guys like have him in the 60s I had him like early 100s, and I came up to like 81 or something. Do you know? You know where? Uh, you have uh, Adunze 96 right now. The okay. wide receiver 47. I mean, I don't even know if we should include him in the in the debate. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I understand. Like Romo Dunze and Leone plays a lot of best ball and stuff. Okay, I, I'm primarily doing just redraft FFPC. You know, doing high stakes leagues and um, you know industry leagues and season stuff like long, that yeah, season long draft yeah I, I think that in a best ball Romo Dunze is a lot more attractive than in just straight home standard redraft leagues which is what my rankings are geared toward um because I don't I don't know that he's going to be any kind of a factor for the first like five or six games and then the bye weeks hit and if he's not a factor in the first five or six games then you might end up dropping him but he absolutely could be a huge factor in the set in uh by midseason and down the stretch and that's what you want in best ball and i think that those influence the way that leone thinks and he does all these shows with the, sh the ship chasers and all that the you know the the, the social the, the spreadsheet socialists and i understand that point of view but i don't rank that way I, my pushback would be i've done two ffpc main events those are high stakes season long redraft leagues and I have Roma Dunze in the seventh round in both. So, you know, putting my mouth where my money is on Roma Dunze, it's not a best ball thing. It's a the dude was drafted ninth overall, was a great wide receiver prospect. And I think when these rookies come into these crowded rooms, we just are like a little bit too concerned about, oh, how's he gonna work in and a little bit not concerned enough with just how talented the player is. Yeah. Now, I agree with Evan. We have him third of the Chicago receivers in target share. But you can't have guys like Keon Coleman, Jameis Williams, you know, ahead of a guy like Roma Dunze with this prospect profile, this draft capital. The Bears are going to run a ton of three wide receiver sets. Yeah. And while Evan's right, he's an underdog to be in the top two in targets out of the gate. He's not drawing dead there. And over the course of the season – that back weighted second half of the production matters more anyway. So I think you really want to buy into talent. I think Roma Dunze is one of the best buys in all of fantasy football because he's going similar to rookie wide receivers around him. 
that were much worse prospects, had much worse draft capital because people are just way overthinking the quality of the landing spot. Okay. Yeah. I've already reassessed Romo Dunze once, and I, I am willing to go back and do it again. If you want to include this in the debate, that's fine. I can capitulate. Um, but I, I, I'm not thinking about him in the same way that, that you are, clearly. Yeah. I'll say this about Roma Dunze. We just had Matt Harmon on, and he called Keenan Allen one of the most overrated wide receivers in. Yeah, but the, he also did. He also called Keenan Allen that last year. So yeah, I mean, and Keenan Allen's 30, 32 now. I don't think it's crazy to think that Roma Dunze is already their best or second best. I think Keenan Allen receiver. is the perfect like receiver that you want to stick with on the field with a rookie quarterback, and he's gonna you know I mean, he might lead the team in targets in the first five or six weeks. Sure. And then he's probably yeah. going to fade. And then that's when Odunze is going to come up. I think Odunze is going to be an impact player in the second half of the year. I mean, yeah. that, to Leone's point, I do think that they should and will run a ton of three wide receiver sets. Go ahead, Leone. I was going to say the other thing, like the based on the cost, like all three of these receivers have contingency upside where if one of the other two gets hurt, now the target share that we we're worried about squeezes and is a little bit better. It's more condensed. Um, so when you look at that relative to cost, the guy that's cheapest has that same potential benefit as the two guys that are way more expensive. And that's sort of how we have it. Like we have DJ Moore is fine. We have Keenan Allen as like a, a little bit better value relative to cost. And then Adunze as the best value relative to cost. Yeah. Okay. Score is three to two now. Evan is in the lead. Leone sweeps the Bears wide receiver categories. A correlated sweep there for sure. A correlated sweep on those. Let's go to... Number six, Jonathan Taylor. Now, this was one that actually surprised me. We are up higher on JT, 14th overall, the RB4. Silva is down at 29 overall, the RB9. I believe it is Evan's turn to go first here on being lower than market on Jonathan Taylor. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I am in a draft right now with Mike Clay, who is a re he's really good at playing fantasy football. And um, he took Jonathan Taylor at the 112. Um, and, and then I looked at, oh, God, we're going to be deb debating Jonathan Taylor today. I was like, oh, I got a little scared. Okay. But, um, yeah, geez, you guys have him RB4. So Anthony Richardson's throw rate to running backs going back to college has always been really low. Jonathan Taylor has really never been a – pass catcher himself going back to Wisconsin. That is a concern. Um, I have concerns over Shane Steichen using Anthony Richardson uh, with the, uh, the the tush push, tush push. Um, and those are where my two concerns stem from. Also, Jonathan Taylor has a pretty extensive uh, ankle injury history at this point. And that seems like, I don't have any data to back this up, but it seems like just, you know, what, covering the sport for a long time, the players that, especially at running back, players that have uh, uh, ankle injuries, they can become chronic. Um, so that's another concern of mine. But it's he's not going to catch many passes. I'm worried about him getting vultured by his quarterback at the goal line. Those are my two primary concerns with Jonathan Taylor. And also, I mean, he's just – he's risky. I mean, he's a running back at significant injury risk, I think. Um, but, I mean, go, go ahead. I know Ben Gretsch loves him. You're – by the way, you know, to, to, to show some love for Leone, his, his series every year with Ben Gretsch on, on ETE is great. Uh, and Ben yeah. Gretsch loves him this year. Yeah, Leone, go ahead with your retort on JT. Yeah, I don't feel super strongly on this one. Uh, Evan mentioned that podcast with Gretsch, and we did kind of even out the touchdowns between Richardson and JT a little bit. We have both of those guys in the top 10 in rushing touchdowns this year for our current projections. We just think there could be a lot of touchdowns on the ground for the Colts and we have them pretty split. I could see it going a little bit heavier, Anthony Richardson. Um, that's where he's going to be dynamite and a really big fantasy asset. The big thing with Jonathan Taylor, you know, he's still in the prime of his career. There aren't a ton of backs in the NFL anymore where we just feel like they're really explosive, talented players. I think Jonathan Taylor is one of them. Even like dealing through some stuff last year was at 4.4 yards per carry at 5.0 for his career has always been a really efficient wide receiver, even though he's not used a ton in that regard. So I think he's a pretty safe pick as far as running backs go in round two, but I'm not going to go like crazy to bat for him. Um, 
maybe that'll give me a loss here in this one. I think he's he's probably in most home leagues going to go a little bit too early. I take him more middle of the second round. Yeah, and to me, it's a similar outlook as Saquon Barkley, right? Like pretty similar. Like I like the player on both. I'm concerned about losing touchdowns to your quarterback. I'm concerned about uh, uh, your pass catching profile when your quarterback is Anthony Richardson. I do think there's some systemic risk and I like the Colts, you know, but I think there's some systemic risk. What if Anthony Richardson just like is non-functional as an NFL quarterback? I don't, I don't think that's how it's going to go. I think he's going to be good, but there's probably some like 20%, 15% chance He's just not it. And, and that scares me on JT a little bit as well. So I'll go ahead and give this one to Evan being a little bit lighter here on JT. Let's go to number seven. Another interesting running back play. It's Josh Jacobs. ETR ranks 35 overall on Jacobs, RB12. Silva 24 overall on Jacobs, the RB7. I will let Leone go first here on Josh Jacobs. Yeah, I like Josh Jacobs a lot in best ball where <laughs> Silva mentions the ship chasers and whatnot. And the community that drafts best ball has, you know, Josh Jacobs falling into the 50s there in, in half PPR formats. And that's where I'm really taking him. I do think that even though I expect Marshawn Lloyd or AJ Dillon to be involved, that it's going to be like a, like a, a 70 30 split not like a 60 40 or 55 45 type split for jacobs it's a really good offense he has that kind of workhorse talent i think we can say like backs that can earn this workload do have a talent for it it's not solely just the coaches giving them opportunity so he's shown that ability to be used at the goal line in the passing game all facets of the game so do like jacobs but yeah i don't think it's quite like an 85 15 split i think lloyd the rookie is a little bit of a danger um, if he comes in and is an explosive right away. I think people make too much of Josh Jacobs' poor advanced rushing stats last year. Like they were putrid. So I'm mostly dismissing that, but I don't want to like 100% dismiss that in light of a rookie incoming. Um, I'd feel a lot better about Jacobs if it was just him and A.J. Dillon, for example. So we're pretty neutral in terms of his positional rank on running backs relative to the market. But this is where we just have the running backs being way overvalued relative to the wide receivers in most home leagues. Yeah, and to be clear, Evan has Josh Jacobs ahead of Saquon, ahead of JT, ahead of Derrick Henry, ahead of Travis Etienne. So go ahead on being higher, actually kind of in line with market. Josh Jacobs is going to be around three pick, early round three pick probably in home leagues. But go ahead on Josh Jacobs being 24 overall here, Evan. Yeah, I mean, I, again, my rankings are geared more toward home standard redraft leagues and um, or, you know, half PPR. And uh, I, I think that he's, you know, if you want to get Josh Jacobs, you're going to have to take him in the second round, I, I think, at the end of the day uh, in, in, in home leagues. So that's where I have him right now. I have him actually at the end of the second round at what, 23 or 24 overall. Mm -hmm. I really believe in the Packers offense this year. I think they could take it. I mean, they were awesome in the second half. Jordan Love just absolutely took off over the final 10 games. He was like one of the best quarterbacks statistically in the league during that time frame. Um, Marshawn Lloyd, who I really like as a player, uh, as a prospect, I took him in a dynasty league about a month ago, and he's had a super disappointing start to training camp. He's been injured. The coaches were asked about him. They're like, he's not making any, any progress. Uh, it, there have been reports that A.J. Dillon has the number two running back spot on lock. That's really good news for Josh Jacobs because, you know, A.J. Dillon's a, a really cool guy off the field, on the field. He's got, you know, he, he's got some limitations. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, Josh Jacobs has access to a ton of touches. He's got that workhorse track record. He is a solid pass catcher. Um and as we talked about on the Brain of Thorn show, uh, uh, the Packers' offensive line is better in run blocking than it is in pass protection. So I just I think that he brings this like comfort level that they did not have with Aaron Jones to where they can put the ball in his belly a lot over and over and over again, throw it to him, and they're going to score a lot of points. So I, I, Josh Jacobs is another guy that I want in my home leagues. Uh, I, I'll say a few things here. First, I don't really buy these AJ Dillon reports at all. There's been the exact opposite reports from other people like The Athletic who say that Marshawn, Lynch, Marshawn Lloyd's having a great camp and he's 
guy that's going to be number number two. There's been other guys like the Leap and uh, some other people that have said AJ Dillon looks great. He's in the best shape of his life. He's going to be the RB two. What I do think is who, whoever wins that job is going to play a little bit more than Evan thinks. I think Matt Lafleur has a very long history of going 60 40 65 35 with his backs i think he will stick to that i guess my last question evan would be if we're talking about workhorse in a good offense what's the difference between josh jacobs who has a 24 adp and joe mixon who has a 42 adp to me they're kind of similar bets workhorse have shown the ability to be a workhorse be reasonable in the past game and on really good offenses what do you think the difference is between jacobs who you have up at 24 overall and mixon at 50. I think Josh Jacobs is a better player. That's where I would begin. Um, Joe Mixon is like, I, I think, on a downward trajectory, although he does project for a lot of touches. Um, I, I think that there's a chance that Damian Pierce um, could eat away at him because Damian Pierce brings more big playability. Joe Mixon has like zero big playability. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, I don't think that A.J. Dillon – A.J. Dillon definitely doesn't have any big playability. Uh, so I'm going to give this one to Leone because I cannot bring myself to take Josh Jacobs over guys, wide receivers going after him, such as Debo, Nico Collins, Mike Evans, Jalen Waddell, Pittman, Diggs, Metcalf. It's just, that's a tough sell for me. I know we talked about this some on the dead zone, but it's not going to get to that because Josh Jacobs, like Evan said, is probably going to go in round two. And I think that's just a little rich for me on that kind of running back to be clear i would take nico collins over him as well okay let's go down a little bit further on the board here to wide receiver number eight debate is going to be deontay johnson etr ranks are at 81 overall wide receiver 38 silva all the way up at 47 overall wide receiver 29 it is leone's turn to go first we are my god 34 spots behind silva on deontay johnson I like Deontay Johnson. He's always been a target earner. I think he's going to step into this situation in Carolina right away, lead the team in targets. Uh, I think Carolina could be a little bit better than they were last year. But like all these things said, there's three teams we have with an average Vegas team total over the course of a season under 20 points. Carolina is one of them. So it's a team that's not expected to score a lot. And despite that, and we saw this last year, they're not going to throw a whole ton. And That's a bad combination for upside. And it's not like Deontay Johnson's been this huge efficiency guy. He's been a target earner. So this is a really big volume play. And I think he's fine where we have him ranked. But if you're going to start moving him up into an area where you've got him competing with other players that have a lot more explosiveness or a better offense, you're entering a territory where like, yeah, maybe you end up okay because of raw targets, but there's very little ceiling in terms of getting a huge return on your investment there. Evan, your retort. And again, I, I want to be clear here. Deontay Johnson's ADP is at, my God, 91.3. And Evan is at 47 overall. So go ahead, Evan, on Deontay Johnson. Yeah, I might have to move him down just on account of that. I, there are some guys like you, you don't want to be too far ahead of ADP um, because then you're kind of like le- leading the audience astray. Like we, you know, the, the audience needs to be aware of ADP and we have it on the, on the sheet when you're looking at the, at the 150, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. So I, I agree with pretty much everything that, De- that uh, Leone just said about Deontay Johnson. Um, he is not a massive upside play, but to me, a wide receiver 29, I'm not expecting him to be a massive upside play. That's like a fringe. That's a mid range w- wide receiver three. Um, which I would and I would love to have a guy with the target upside, the access to a ton of targets that Deontay Johnson does um, as my wide receiver three in a half or full PPR league. Um, I think he's a quality wide receiver three pick this year, and that's where I have him ranked accordingly. Um, you look at the target count, I, I, and I, I think the one thing that I would disagree with Leone about is that this is just p- pure volume. I do think that Deontay Johnson – is a quality player. You hear Matt Harmon talk about Matt Har- Harmon loves Deontay Johnson. Maybe maybe, maybe too much, um, but he's going to. I mean, he's going to dominate targets here. Xavier Leggett, he was a reach in the in the first round. Um, Adam Thielen is what 32, 33 years old. 
really faded in the second half last year. They got nothing at tight end. Um, and, and then if you factor in the possibility that Bryce Young takes a sophomore leap, which I think is the key to unlock unlocking some of that upside that Deontay Johnson might offer um, that, you know, under Dave Canales, who has a really good history with quarterbacks, Geno Smith, Baker Mayfield um, has kind of resurrected careers. Bryce Young needs a resurrection here. Um, you know, that Deontay Johnson, that, that's where the upside comes in for Deontay Johnson. I, I, I'm going to move him down just to, on account of ADP, but he's still a guy that I, I'm very happy with getting as my wide receiver three. It just seems like people are drafting him more as a wide receiver four or five. That's crazy. That is crazy. I, I just know on the that, that you volume, can get him as a wide receiver four or five when he's got a chance at 140 targets. On the volume efficiency thing, Deontay Johnson's career 6.8 yards per target. Yeah. Uh, Zay Flowers, for example, 7.9 in his rookie season last year. Like, give me that profile over Deontay Johnson seven days a week. Yeah, and, and I, I'm going to give this one to Leone. I, I think Deontay Johnson is the rare kind of receiver that's better in best ball. I know it's counterintuitive, but like getting a bunch of targets that aren't that valuable, but getting targets every week and getting usable scores each week is great. In home leagues, I'm looking for someone to hit a home run. I don't think there's really many paths to Deontay Johnson hitting an absolute home run this year, unless you think Bryce Young all of a sudden turns it on. I'm real skeptical, like real skeptical uh, on that. So yes, I, I am will... too. But I mean, we have to understand like this was the number one overall pick sure. in the draft. He's going to have much better coaching this year. Indeed. And now he's got a guy who can get open. Yeah. Yeah. I just think like the explosive, like Deontay Johnson is like not explosive enough for me to go that high. So I'll give the one to Leone. Leone is now has four wins. Silva has four wins as we go to number nine player here. Jackson Smith in Jigba. Another one where we thought we were high. 82 overall wide receiver 42. Silva 60 overall wide receiver 35. Leone, I'll let you go first on JSN. A lot of hype around JSN. If we want him, we might actually have to come up a little bit. Yeah, I just, uh, Silva's got to stop hanging out with the spreadsheet socialist, you know, <laughs> first first Malik neighbors, now Jackson Smith and Jigba. I mean, it's out of control. It's enough already, you know, with these young wide receivers. I just, it's insane. So, um, yeah, I, I'm surprised to see Silva so high. I think JSN is a great bounce back candidate where it didn't go great year one. Like, there's no doubt about it. But, you know, part of the reason you drafted him last year was contingent value. Uh, there was only one game where he got that top two wide receiver because of either Metcalf or Lockett missing injury, and he crushed that one game. And he was still a really good prospect. He was the wide receiver one uh, in terms of draft capital out of his class. I think that Tyler Lockett is starting to age out. We saw the efficiency drop last year. That's usually the first sign of a cliff drop off. So I do like JSN quite a bit, but I'm just a little weary of getting him like ahead of the explo you know, the potentially explosive rookie wide receivers like Xavier Worthy. Um, we talked about a you know, those are types of players that I'd be taking ahead of. Um, You're taking Odunze over JSN. Yes. Oh my God. That's, that's egregious. <laughs> uh, Chris Godwin, another one who I think, you know, isn't in that explosive rookie mold, but I think could just blow JSN away in terms no, of targets. No, this is going to be an easy win. Slot role, this so. is going to be an easy win. Okay, All right, go ahead. So, you know, from a fantasy standpoint, JSN did not have a, a, a productive rookie season, but the underlying, like his route metrics, the underlying data was, is pretty strong on him. Uh, Ryan Grubb comes from the University of Washington, the new offensive coordinator in Seattle, ran a spread offense. You know, they had three – wide receivers drafted in the first three rounds. And the best one-for-one -one comparison in terms of roles and usage, when you look at DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Tyler Lockett's falling off, by the way, and DK Metcalf is kind of – he's he's hit his ceiling already. I think we've seen the best of D, of what DK Metcalf can have to, ha, has to offer, and he's just not a, a diverse – he doesn't have a diverse skill set. JSN does have a, a diverse skill set. And, and the, the one-for-one -one comparison in that Washington offense would be Jalen Polk. Jalen Polk had the most productive uh, season last season uh, in, in that Washington offense where they had three receivers drafted in the first three rounds. 
I my bold prediction is that JSN is going to lead the Seahawks in receiving this year. He's going to emerge as their best receiver this season, and I think it's going to hit in week one, and he's going to end up being an absolute smash. I actually think I should have him higher than where I have him right now, um, and I, I might go make that move after the show. So no zero capitulation here. You can just rack up the victory. It's five to four me. I still say one thing. I love the bold take. But as far as like the underlying metrics being good, JSN was at a 20% targets per out run. Tyler Lockett dropping off still at 22% targets per out run. JSN was at 1.32 yards per out the, run. The, the, not the, something that you can't recover from. Winning but that is not, not, that is not a good underlying metric. Like that's not good. That's not a good underlying metric. So yeah. it was, and I do think his role is going to expand and he was shoved well, I mean, into the short eight out role. For him. I mean, he got hurt. You're early. right, but. You yeah. said he had good underlying metrics. He didn't have good underlying okay, metrics. In terms of a, from a route winning standpoint, he's going to blow <laughs> up, Yoni. He's going to blow up. I, I, I think your, that – Boy Sean Siegel had him as like, you know, everyone should be drafting him last year. He's just going to end up being a year early. I, I, th- I think that last year certainly went awry for Jason. Started off with a broken hand. The way he was used was ridiculous. His dot was so close to the line of scrimmage. It was pathetic. My concern is that Tyler Lockett isn't going away. And so what Leone mentioned, when these guys were on the field at the same time, Lockett was still earning targets at a really high rate. I I think that they should be playing JSN over Lockett. I don't know for sure that they will. I want to be clear here, Evan. They're going to play all three guys. They're going to run a spread offense under Ryan Grubb. That's what he did at Washington. They're all going to be on the field together. Uh, Like we we have JSN as a target. So I think we all agree he's a target. It's just a matter of like, how excited we are well evan has 60th overall adp is 116 that Again, is horrible tyler Lock, that's uh, a horrible JSN, i mean that's a crazy adp even in best ball you could get jsn in like the 90s for a while um which was which was nice not so much anymore but yeah i mean 116 jackson within jigba will be very cheap in homelings i think we all agree that he is indeed a target i'm just gonna give that one to Leone though, because again, I am not convinced that JSN is awesome in the NFL and I'm not convinced that Tyler Lockett's going away, but yeah, I like where we're at on JSN here at 82 overall. So Brian Hartline, the Ohio state wide receivers coach, who's coached like Marvin Harrison and, you know, Chris Olave. And I mean, he said that JSN was the best out of all of them. Yeah. You know, wide yeah, receiver. Well, you. Marvin Harrison so, went so fourth overall. Do you think that you know so. better than Brian Hartline? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I do. In this case, I'm gonna say Marvin Harrison's better than Jackson Smith and Jigba. So, yeah. yeah, I'll take that one. Bring it on, Hartline. Hart- <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Let's go to number 10 player here. It is Zamir White. ETR top 300. Half PPR is at 85 overall. The RB 25. Silva's a bit higher, 68 overall on Zemir White. The RB20, I believe it is Leone's turn to go first here on Zemir White. You've, you've given me the first. first okay, like Silva's turn. Up. Silva's turn to go first on <laughs> Zemir White. Go I mean, ahead. you're going to, like, you have to go back and change your judgment on the last one because he's going to win this one. Because we, because we, we have different viewpoints, and you tend to agree with the way that he views. Players not necessarily I'm, open, I'm hearing i'm hearing all arguments let's hear it i mean the That's argument for Samir White is that my rankings are geared toward home redraft leagues where zamir white is a target um you know and and i mean you look at the last four games when zamir after uh they, they were done with josh jacobs zamir white had you know 20 touches a game playing 75 percent of the snaps they did almost nothing to upgrade to bring in any kind of competition this offseason, Antonio Pierce loves him. The The best running back that they had was Alexander Madison. We remember what happened with him last year. Um, I, I am concerned that the Raiders are going to be, like, bad. That That's a big concern. But from a volume standpoint, I, I can absolutely live with having Zamir White as a, a volume projection standpoint. I can live with him ha- having, having him as a back-end RB2 who's just going to get the ball over and over and over and over again. I mean, I think that he's got a chance. Their defense should be pretty good. I think he's got a chance at like 285 carries this season. Also, he's an awesome athlete. He was a speed score freak. He's big. He ran 4-4 flat coming out of college. So he's got a big-time athletic profile. 
big time workload projection. I understand that there's, you know, inherent risk with players of this profile. Um, but I'm willing to live with that as a back end RB two. Yeah. I, I think Leone people are going to say the detractor for Zamir white, which is I'm sure part of your argument is that this is classic. We're projecting guy only because of workload, not because we actually like him, but Leone go ahead with your retort on Zamir white. Yeah. First, I want to know, like, our ranking on Zemir White is our half PPR rankings, which is for home league redraft, um, just to be clear. Yeah. So we're just saying don't draft him in your right. home league is what That's we're exactly saying. That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And, uh, yes, he is the – if you look up dead zone running back in the dictionary, it's a picture of Zemir White. It, he checks every single box. It's a bad team. It's a two-down back who's not going to get third down work. It's a back with very little pedigree. You know, he was a fourth-round pick through two NFL seasons. How many, how many rushing touchdowns does he have through two NFL seasons? Not many. One, one, he's got one. Um, I think he just cleared 500 total rushing yards. Uh, and now I, I, you know, Evan quoted those stats about Drake London. So it's not completely fair. Evan's right that he does set up to get a ton of carries and we shouldn't just look at that production because they had Josh Jacobs last year. But when we're looking at a dead zone back, I mean, you're talking a guy that we're just really thrusting to 280 carries who's done absolutely nothing, who has no draft, pedi- you know, prospect pedigree, really. Yeah, Evans, right? He's got a nice speed score, but he was a fourth round pick. Uh, he didn't play much year one. And yeah, bad team. Third down work. They're already talking about Dylan Lobby. You've got Alexander Madison, who if he cuts down into to the two down work at all for Zamir White, you're already dead. Like from, yeah. from day one, you're dead if it's like, he cuts in so there's just so many ways this goes wrong and at best you get a guy that churns out you know 13 half ppr points per game and it's fine he doesn't kill you but he's not going to win you the league right I, and I, I think i'm going to give that one to leone on small win if it's a win and a big miss if it's a miss the only thing that i'll say is i i, I very much agree with evan's points about antonio pierce loving this guy zamir white being a better athlete than i think people realize and I actually think the Raiders are going to be better than people think. Like, I think their defense can actually play and they're going to be in games a lot. But yeah, just the profile of a back that I don't really want to be on here as he goes 68th overall in home leagues right now. We're going to skip George Pickens here. I, I know you guys um, uh, were wanting or waiting for 14 guys. We had Pickens on the list here, but we're going to skip him because there's a lot in flux right now. I'm sure you guys have seen we're recording this. Wednesday, August 7th, around 3 p.m. Eastern, and rumors that Brandon Ayuk is going to Pittsburgh are flying heavy. That would obviously impact George Pickens a lot. We're going to skip him. Let's go to David Njoku. ETR top 300 is at 100 overall on Njoku. The tight end 10. Silva 77 overall, the tight end 7 on the chief David Njoku. Leone's turn to go first here on Njoku. Yeah, I do like Njoku. You know, he's a really good athlete, had a huge breakout last year over the second half of the season. But I, I'm somewhat concerned that like that was the peak for him. Like all came together for him. And when we look at how this offense ran with Deshaun Watson versus when they threw in Joe Flacco, it was quite different. Um, Watson takes a lot more sacks. Watson scrambles some. They also run a little bit heavier in terms of their pass rate over expectation with him. And if you look at the splits with Watson for Njoku, it was really, really bad. You know, it was a huge switch. And then with Flacco, they had some weird games too, honestly, that like Njoku's talented. So he was able to take advantage of that, but they had a game where like the kicker got hurt and they were going for it on every fourth down against Houston when they put up like 40 and they just kept throwing and throwing. So I think that there's just a little bit too much recency bias and how the second half of the season broke for Evans ranking. I'm not like out on Njoku, but you know, I, I just think that is aggressive and he belongs more with like Brock Bowers, Dallas Goddard type tier. Wow. Evan, go ahead. And, and by the way, Njoku ADP is 88 overall. As I mentioned, Evan is at 76 overall on David Njoku. Yeah, I have him in a spot where like you have a real good chance of getting him. And I like want to get David and Joku this year. And th- this actually isn't a, a too egregious ranking. I don't think I'm in, I think I'm like in the perfect spot relative relative to ADP. Um, you know, you, you talk about those splits between Watson and Flacco and I, everything that you said is correct there. What Watson did show a level of chemistry with David and Joku last year though, 
completed 77% of his intended targets to David Njoku. David Njoku firmly in his prime. He's only 28 years old. You know, he's one of these later career breakout tight ends. Um, you talk about the way that the offense functioned last year, Watson, Flacco, et cetera. Their offense is going to be different this year because they don't have Nick Chubb, who was the centerpiece of their offense. Obviously, he went out early. But, I mean, the whole offense was geared toward running the ball under their old offense. That's not going to be the case anymore. They bring in Ken Dorsey, who has that background with Brian Dable. They're going to throw the ball more. David Njoku has played over 80% of the snaps in consecutive seasons. He's not coming off the field. They're pl- paying him a ton of money. He's an absolute beast out there after the catch. Um, yeah, I I, I want to be above ADP on him, not too far. I, I think I have him ranked perfectly, honestly. And, and, and another thing is that you have you have Kyle Pitts ahead of him, right? Yes. Yeah, easy. Yeah, see, I don't. I, I have Njoku over Pitts. Yes. Um, I've consulted the PSM, and we have decided in a joint ruling here that one is going to go to Evan. I mean, close your eyes, bet on an athlete. David Njoku went absolutely berserk last year, given opportunities. And there's been some good coach speak. I don't put too much stock into it, but stuff from Stefanski, like David Njoku is one of the guys we're actively trying to get the ball to. And and yeah, I, I think he will have a real solid role here, somewhere between the Flacco splits and the Watson splits. All right. You mentioned Kyle Pitts. Evan, let's get to him quickly here. Kyle Pitts, and we don't have to spend too much time on this because it's similar to the London conversation. ETR, 55 overall, the tight end, 6. Silva, 78 overall, the tight end, 8. Let's ignore the systemic stuff for a second, Evan. What do you think about Kyle Pitts here? You're going to be below market, it looks like, on Kyle Pitts. Yeah, just full disclosure, for anybody who watched the um, the YouTube of the podcast that we did with Matt Harmon, uh, about halfway through the podcast, like I, I like I like – I'm like, I'm like getting all like flustered. I, like I'm not talking, but I'm like smiling and kind of laughing and also being mad at the same time. It's because I was being attacked about my rankings of, well, Josh Jacobs, but mainly Kyle Pitts and then Leone and, because I, I don't have him high enough or something. And um, and then Leone um, admitted later in our Slack that he has like a huge position on Kyle Pitts. So he's obviously biased. Obviously biased. <laughs> Chicken and egg. Um, Chicken and egg. Look, look, Kyle Pitts is a former Mackey Award winner. Okay. He went for over a thousand yards as a rookie. And I think that he was good. And now I don't know if he's good anymore because this this knee injury, like he's running around on one leg. Is is that going to just all of a sudden go away? Um, Again, I I don't know if, and from what I've heard is that they are going to revolve this offense around B. John Robinson and Drake London, maybe not necessarily to the extent with Kyle Pitts, a lot of projection involved, a lot of assumptions that he's going to bounce back from this long-standing knee injury. Did he even have surgery to fix it? I mean, th- he played with it all of last year, right? And then he was like, "Oh, after I don't know if he had surgery after the season, but he was like, you know, I'm finally going to get a full off season of health. That, that's all I've seen on it. But it was 100 percent last year, way worse than he let on. I don't know. I, I think that having him tight end eight, where I have him is like pretty aggressive based on what we've seen out of him for the last two years. Uh, just a, a, you have a faith-based projection coming coming here from Leone. Go ahead, Leone. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the systemic stuff with Drake London, so don't need to rehash that. But Kyle Pitts, you know, look at Njoku. We often see these athletic tight ends take a little bit of time. Kyle Pitts already flashed in his rookie year over 1,000 yards. And we're going to write him off because of two down seasons, one where he wasn't fully healthy under a horrific coach in Arthur Smith. And by the way, he's only 23 years old. He's younger than a lot of these tight ends, um, like Trey McBride that everyone thinks are like so young and, and Pitts is this vet. He, for his career, has averaged 13.8 yards per catch. That's almost two and a half yards per catch more than David Njoku. Players like this just don't come around very often. I, you know, I haven't talked about not wanting to, miss the boat on Devin Achan. I don't want to miss the boat on Kyle Pitts. I know last year, probably too high on him in the same Arthur Smith offense, but he'll be completely different this year. I think he's going to see similar target volume or more. I think he's going to have a similar target share to David Njoku on a team that's going to throw more. 
and he's going to have more efficiency on those targets than David Njoku. So it's really hard for me to see David Njoku ahead of Kyle Pitts. I, I will, if I'm going to be bold, I really think like we could be drafting Kyle Pitts in round two next year. So, so uh, to me, it's like, do you think Kyle Pitts can actually win against NFL safeties and cornerbacks because they're not playing him in line enough, right? Like he's not getting enough routes against those guys. Maybe in the new offense, he will. I think that there's a tear break. I prefer Kincaid, McBride, and Andrews to Pitts. And maybe I've just been too scarred. You know, I totally get the argument for Pitts. I've lost an unconscionable amount of money on this guy. And I, maybe I'm too scarred by it. But I prefer the Kincaid, McBride, Andrews tier personally over Pitts. I do prefer Pitts over Njoku uh, to make that clear. But still here, I am going to give the win to Silva. Last one. Brandon Cooks. ETR is at 126 overall, the wide receiver 59. Silva way up on Brandon Cooks, 93 overall, the wide receiver 45. I believe it is Leone's turn to go first on Brandon Cooks. Yeah, I get why Silva has Brandon Cooks where he does. He had a good second half of the season from a fantasy standpoint. There is very little target competition behind C.D. Lamb in an offense that's going to throw a ton and going to put up points and run tons of plays. So I get it from that perspective, but we do have a receiver who's entering his age 30 season who's showing signs of decline. Uh, on a per route basis, Brandon Cooks with pretty much no competition last year either, 16% targets per route run, 1.24 yards per route run on an offense that was rolling through the air. That's really bad. That's atrocious. So I think this is a case of like, you see the opportunity, you want it to be there, you want it to happen, but at the end of the day, it's a player that's just not that good. And I think last year is probably you know, the peak for Cooks. I don't know if there's a ceiling beyond it, and there's a lot of ways that like he's just not good enough anymore, that Jalen Tolbert passes him or someone that we don't even know passes him. So I've taken him in best ball around where we have him ranked, where I think like being out there for Dallas is good, but I don't, in a redraft setting, see any sort of meaningful ceiling for Brandon Cooks. Evan, your reply? I mean, I think that there's definitely a ceiling there um, because he's got a quality quarterback, plays indoors. That's going to be one of the throw, the throw heaviest teams in the NFL this year. And um, as you mentioned, you know, we're talking about guys like Jalen Tolbert. I mean, we were last year too. Michael Gallup was so bad he had to retire. Right, and he could. He, yeah, he, was terrible. And he, he also was. was terrible. Um, he went to a new team last year, so I think that there could could be some possibility that he has a better season in his second. I just there's just I don't think there's any risk here. I, I have him ranked as like a fringe wide receiver four slash five. Um, I don't know if he's good at, anymore either. He's he turns thirty one in September. You mentioned this, the the shitty data on him last year. I, I just I don't think that there's any real downside here to a wide receiver four slash five. Um, and I do think that there's upside because of the the circumstance, you know, in this, in the second year in the offense and, and in his environment. So, yeah, I mean, he had the same setup last year. I mean, I know Michael Gallup was there, but he was just total dust. Even in the same setup last year, Brandon Cooks had played 16 games, only had 54 catches on 81 targets for 657 yards and eight touchdowns. So a bit propped up there by the touchdown stuff. His he, he did have a game where he had like 170 yards. Yeah. So that wow, gives me just a little – He had one game over 50 yards. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to let me finish? <laughs> so at least it gives you a little – I think he had 10 catches for like 173 yards. It, it, it gives you a little glimmer of hope that he's got some level of explosiveness left in his tank, and, and he did get better as the season progressed in his first year in the new offense. I mean, look, I get it. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, th this guy might be cooked – you know, for, for lack of a better term in this instance, but I, yeah, he, he I, I think it's with, worth it as a wide receiver four slash five, but I don't care if you want to draft Brandon Cooks, I don't care. Yards, 10 yards, 14 yards, 60 yards, 39. I'm just saying like in your rankings, like guys like uh, Romeo Dobbs, like he's got a good combination of getting volume, like safe, like Brandon Cooks, but with a way better ceilings. There's guys like that. There's rookies like Brian Thomas that are going to play. And if you're in a redraft league, like you, you don't, you don't need Brandon Cooks as like nine points per game. Yeah. Uh, 
I I totally agree on Cooks. I, I with Leonia. I, I would for sure take Roma Dunze and some of these other rookies uh, over Brandon Cooks. I would also take Jordan Addison ahead of Brandon Cooks if we found out that he wasn't going to be suspended this year at all, which is actually uh, kind of coming into a very real possibility now. So I will give that one to Leone, and that turned out to be the decider. 13 guys we debated today. Leone, seven wins. Evan, six in a very, very close man versus machine battle. I mean, I obviously won the JSN argument, so it was really seven to six me, but... Mm. Yeah. Oh, and I uh, one yeah, not trusting the results. Classic. One, one, <laughs> one, 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 one last thing on Brandon Cooks. His ADP is down at 149 overall. There, I don't have no problem with Brandon Cooks if you're in a deep league or something like that. But up at 93, where Evan has him is not where I'd be taking. Brandon Cooks be swinging for a little bit more difference-making upside. All right. This was fun. Man vs. Machine is always fun every year. Appreciate you all being here. We'll be back tomorrow with myself and Evan to talk about ranking changes Evan has made based on news and other reactions to news over the last week. It has been a very busy week in terms of news with trades, injuries, et cetera. Stay tuned for that. Also, first real preseason slate of the year starts Thursday. If you have not picked up our preseason DFS package and props, head to the preseason tab on the site. For producer Ryan, for Leone, for Bruce or Luke, for Silva, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.